Easy parking with Easy Trip. Now available at Dundrum Town Centre. So you can now use your toll tags to park in our car parks. Simply register at easytrip.ie forward slash parking. Easy parking with Easy Trip. Dundrum, where more happens. Again, beloved, that is 929-477-3997. Now, if you live outside of the continental United States of America, call us in right now at 1, then 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, that is 1, then 929-477-3997. We are excited tonight. I've been looking for uh, this uh, particular topic, this brand-new series uh, for some time now. And we have with us not only uh, a true and authentic uh, 21st century apostle, but also a man of God for this time that carries an apostolic anointing that I believe that predates the church, the anointing of the original 12 apostles. And that is uh, a dear friend of mine and uh, a dear colleague in the gospel, my brother in the Lord, um, the Honorable Apostle J.L. Macklin, who is the uh, Apostle, Prophet, and the Senior Pastor of the World Renowned Acts Fellowship Church, and they're in Bernie, Texas. Please call us in right now, 929-477-3997. And I am so very honored to be sitting at your feet tonight, man of God, not just me, my production team, and all of our listeners around the world. And uh, Apostle Macklin, thank you so much, my friend for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be back with us here tonight on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Well, God bless you, Bishop. Um, it's an honor to be back again. It's been, what, a couple of weeks now? And so let's, uh, yeah. let's, let's see what we can do to make sure people's lives are better than they were before they called in tonight. Oh, my God. I am so excited. And we are entering into a brand new series. You got to hear this, Saints of God. Leadership, spiritual leadership in the Apostolic Church. Again, leadership, spiritual leadership in the Apostolic Church. And I have to say also, man of God, that uh, you have a unique Apostolic brand. 
that no one else has. And before we get into this brand new apostolic series, can you lead us into the mind of God in prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, we come before you just thanking you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the love that you've shown us by giving us your son. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. We ask you, Father, to give us grace tonight to understand the things that you want us to know about leadership, that we may be transformed into your son, that we may display him and emulate him at every facet of his life. And we believe you're going to do it in the name of the Most High, the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, my friend. 929-477-3997. We are nationally syndicated through the Talk America Radio Network out of Dallas, Texas. Now, beloved, the Talk America Radio Network is indeed the new dominant force in conservative talk radio, and we are ever so blessed to be internationally syndicated to 150 markets around the world. Around this globe, now we have the uh, opportunity to have access to at least one billion people on a weekly basis through the iHeartRadio network and the iHeartRadio media group also here in New York City, New York. And if you want to, uh, as always, send in your questions via email, you can do so right now at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. Again, quickly, beloved, Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at yahoo.com. Leadership, uh, spiritual leadership. Uh, in the 21st century church, and to all of you young preachers, not just young preachers, but preachers personified, if you're a part of the apostolic fivefold government of Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we invite you into this apostolic studio tonight uh, to sit under, I believe, the most prolific apostle that we've had uh, in the 25 years of our global ministry here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And again, that is the Honorable Apostle J.L. Macklin. Uh, Apostle Macklin, let's begin the foundation of leadership, uh, spiritual leadership uh, in the 21st century apostolic church. What is leadership? Define that for us, man of God, as we are laying this foundation uh, tonight. Sure, Bishop. I, I think that um, it's basically leadership that emulate, emulates from Jesus Christ's life. And his life was a life that people forget that it was a spirit-led life. So everything that Jesus Christ encompassed came from the Father, and it was, he was led by the Spirit of God. So the way he interacted with his, with his disciples, the way he interacted with other people, that was God's version of leadership that he wanted his church, his leaders, and, and everyone else to display. And so, uh, for example, when Jesus said that, you know, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he was indicating to us that his version of living and leading and counseling and teaching and all the things that he's done came not from himself, but it came from his father. And where is his father? In the heavens. So leadership is a, it's a DNA thing. And when someone uses the term DNA, it's talking about um, the innermost parts, the blood. The word says the life of all flesh is in the blood. And so we're talking about the life of Christ. And so in order for you to lead in Christ's church the way he wants you to lead, it can't be taught in seminary. It can't be taught in church classes. It can't be taught through life experiences. It only can be realized and taught by having a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he then pours himself into you as the Father has poured himself into him. My God. And you know what, man of God, I, I have never heard of this term until the Lord um, birth that into you to give to us. And this is the reason why Apostle J.L. Macklin has a brand, an apostolic brand like none other, 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, 929-477-3997. Leadership, spiritual leadership, and spiritual development 
in the 21st Century Church with our teacher here today, the Honorable uh, Dr. J.L. Macklin. Apostle, um, what are the principles of leadership? If you can really outline that for us so we can get a better understanding of this powerful uh, revelatory term. Sure, Bishop, but I think but before I give those, if you don't mind, I want to I wanna juxtapose uh, yeah. leadership here for a second. Num- number one, yes. you know, the worldly definition of leadership, we all know, it's basically the action of leading a group of people or an organization. But what the worldly definition of leadership doesn't cover is how and by what source. I want to say that one more time for your listeners. It doesn't describe yes. how, and it doesn't indicate by what source. As we've taught, I think I've been on your show almost a million times by now, Bishop, and I always talk about <laughs> sources. Yes. The source determines the fruit. So if mm-hmm. you want to know how something is supposed to be and how something uh, uh, should function properly, you always go back to its source. And so when the worldly definition of leadership comes into play, my friend, it it talks about the action of leading a group of people or an organization, but it doesn't talk about who's sponsoring the people being led, who's giving the leader the source and the power, Hmm. by which goals are reached. It's the the source of something, my friend, that actually gives Hmm. it its identity and its power. And as, as you know, I'm a mili- I'm a retired military man, so I prefer yes. the military term of leadership. And and what's amazing is is that it it speaks in many ways. You would think that they saw Jesus' life, and they took it, and said, "This is what we're going to call leadership." The definition is defined like right. this, and I know it by heart. I've said it so many times. It's the process of influencing someone to accomplish a mission by providing purpose motivation, and direction. I want your listeners Mm. to think about that for a second. Hmm. The process of leading someone to accomplish a mission by providing, number one, purpose, number two, motivation, and number three, direction. Those are three Mm. different distinct things. And as we look at the life of Christ, what you're going to find out, just don't look, listeners, don't look at the miracles. Don't look at walking on water. Don't look at the temptation. Right. I want you for, for once, I want you, every leader should do this. When the Holy Spirit gave this concept to me a long time ago, my friend, I realized something. He, he said, stop looking at what Jesus did. I want you to look at who he is and who he was. Mm-hmm how he interacted with people. And if you pay attention carefully to the language of the text, what you're going to find is that he always provided purpose, motivation, and direction. Right now, there's a lot of Mm. uh, purpose talk, and there's a lot of motivation talk, but only the spirit can provide direction. I want your listeners to understand that. Only the Spirit of God can provide direction because he leads man and guides man to all truth. And so without the Spirit of God, there can be no direction. And so as we examine Christ, the things that I I realize I want people to get tonight is that there are several principles that I want you to check out in leadership. And, uh, you know, if I'm on your show, I'm always – I think your people should take notes. If you're listening, you should always take notes. You should never listen to spiritual teaching or spiritual conversation (laughs) without having a pen and a pad. Always, you know. Number one I want want everybody to understand is that it's spirit-led. That's the number one principle of leadership. It's always spirit-led. It's not carnal-led. It's not statistic-led. It's not popularity-led. It's not social-led. It is all Mm. spirit-led. And it's essential that, that, that your listeners understand that because being spirit-led, that means that God himself who has
has a, as I said earlier in a video, video I did on Facebook, he has a large yes. panorama view of things. He has the beginning and the, be, and the ending. So because he sees both perspectives, because he knows what he's going to do, when you have his spirit and you're led by his spirit and you allow his spirit to instruct how you lead, you in turn will not make bad decisions. You in turn have a full understanding and a full development. So in Romans 8, chapter 12, Bishop, and at any time, please intervene. You know, this is your show. I'm just your guest. Oh, no, um, <laughs> in Romans <laughs> chapter 8, I yes, want to bring to your, to your attention to your listeners. Romans chapter 8, and I want to begin in verse yes. 12 here. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the mm. flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now, juxtapose yes. it. So he's saying, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Well, there's only there's only two things, my friend. There's only flesh and spirit, right? So by indicating right. to us that you either live by the flesh or and you shall die, he's telling us that not living according to the flesh by default means you live by the spirit. Mm-hmm. So then he goes further, and he says, but mm-hmm. if ye through the spirit, listen, listen to what the apostle says, listeners, but if ye through yes. the Spirit, what does it say? Through the Spirit. Now, some translations through try to change spirit. it up. Through the Spirit. He says, but if you through yes. the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Right. I, could, I could teach on that for six hours, so I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> for as yes, many as are led by the Spirit of God, they Yes. Are the sons of God Now listen. Right. He is saying to us That those who are his you know, Apostles, teachers, evangelists Prophets, pastors Elders, everybody Who's in the household of faith They say that they belong To the Lord, isn't that what they all say My right. friend yes, If sir. it is true and accurate then what the apostle is saying by the Spirit of God's commission is that you have to be led to mm. die and mortify the deeds of your body yes. first in order for the Spirit to lead you. Right. Or for you to lead others. So, so the criteria, the number one principle of leadership is that you yourself must be spirit-led in order to lead other people who may or may not be led by the spirit, which means you've got to mortify yourself. You've got to have the mind of God completely in every single way. So he's saying to us that if, if you're going to lead my people, if you're going to be my son, if you're going to be my daughter, if you're in the household of faith in any level or any position or in any office or any role, you must be led by the Spirit. Why? Because you yes. are a son or a daughter. So the moment, I, the moment you called me an apostle, and you know that to be true, those who, yes. who, who are in our fellowship know that to be true. But they must be verified by my life. Let me say that mm. again. My <laughs> life, my, my life yes. gives verification to my leadership. Remember when Paul said to them, my friend, mm. about um, I may not be an apostle to others, but I am, I am indeed an apostle right. to you? He said that yes. to them because they knew him. They knew his life. They knew his life was led by the Spirit of God. So he had full integrity with them because they knew him to be so. So when you're led mm-hmm. by the Spirit of God, you in turn yes. can lead others into the Spirit of God, and it becomes organic, my friend. It's, it's a perpetual yes. thing. So what happens is I'm led by the Spirit, the people in our fellowship learning how to be led by the Spirit from me because I am led by the Spirit. And all of a sudden, it becomes organic. That means everybody – now, this is where we, we get – and I know you – knowing you, you got some questions for later. But yes. <laughs> what's interesting Dude. is that this is how we avoid church drama. Church, The, the yes. enemy of church drama is spirit-led. Awesome. 
communication. Right. Spirit-led. What is now, those of you who haven't listened to us before as we come on together, one thing I want you to understand something. I'm going to say, because the reason why I'm prefacing this, Bishop, because I'm about to say something that's going to, you know. Witches have a broom. They have a, 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 a wand. They have a book. Mm-hmm. Satanists have a book. They have amulets. Amulets and all other religions is different, and false gods have that. So do you, church. You have the word of God. It is the connectivity. Moreover, it is the Urim and Thorum conduit. It is the breath on, once again that triggers God's presence. Why? Because you need to have his word as a baseline to understand whether or not his spirit is leading you. Mm. I hope everybody mm. understood mm. what I just said. I know I said a lot. Oh, that's powerful. <laughs> but you Jeez. must have you must have the word that illuminates oh, powerful. to you information that the spirit of God, for example, my friend, before we move on yes. to the next point, for example, yes. Yes, sir. Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he shall not on, speak now. of himself, but he shall right. speak of what I have told you. Now, let's just stop right there, listeners. He yes. is indicating that the spirit of God is going to testify of what he has mm-hmm. already said. Now, listeners, were you there when Jesus walked the earth? No. How about did you have lunch with the disciples? No. So what do you have that Jesus could have possibly said to you? The Bible, Mm -hmm. the word of God. Yes. So then the spirit of God in turn illuminates or elucidates the word of God to you, and they both become the two witnesses that you need. So now you have the word telling you something. Then the spirit of God is saying, okay, pastor, apostle, leader, teacher, elder, I don't want you to handle it like this. I want you to handle it like that. And you say, well, right. I don't, I don't want to handle it like Paul handled it. Then the Holy Spirit comes along and says, well, I'm not necessarily telling you to handle it that way, but handle it similar to that way. Tweak it this mm. way. Tweak it that Tweak it that way. In other words, you have to have a spirit-led relationship, and the only way that takes place, my friend, is by having the Word of God being the, the launching point for your information. Because remember, my friend, yes. according to the Apostle John, Jesus Christ was the Word. Now, what we call the Word right. now was really never the Word. The Word was always a person. <laughs> <laughs> so the word was always a person. So the word became wow. flesh and dwelt among men. So so the, the so watch this. The word began as spirit, became flesh, then became spirit, and then the spirit became word, and the word and the spirit identify with one another. I know I said a mouthful, oh my God. but I just explained to you exactly <laughs> what we are witnessing. Christ Jeez, is in the God. heavens. He said, prepare me a body. The body gets prepared. The word comes down and in, 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 in embeds itself in the body. The word walks upon the earth. He becomes the light of all men. He then leaves, and then he says, spirit, take my place. Then the spirit version of it now lives on earth. But then mankind has a written record of Christ walking upon the earth. So man has the spirit that Christ gave him, and he has the word that Christ gave him. Both are the tools that are essential to following true biblical Christ style leadership. That's the first principle. Mm. And I'll stop and allow, and allow you to ask questions before I go any further. A, a man of God, I, I'm telling you, it, it, again, uh, as you and I always say, we're in each other's apostolic warehouse, our warehouse of knowledge. 929 um, and as you, as God was speaking through you so powerfully, as the Lord always does through you, my friend, uh, the Lord spoke to me today in preparing for you uh, in Paul's letter to the Apostolic Church at Rome, in Romans 12 and 2. 
and we often quote this verse, but we really don't understand the true meaning when you talked about the spiritual realm, walking in the spirit. And with your permission, Amanda God, I would like to really just pitch this to you and to see what you think about this as we're really laying the foundation for leadership, spiritual leadership and development in the apostolic church today. And Paul says in Romans 12 and 2, and be not conformed. To this world, and, and and the Lord spoke to me to me today and said that the term conform uh, is a counterfeit form of formation, and and I believe what the Apostle Paul was saying: we don't need to be conformed to this world because we were already formed uh, four thousand years before in Genesis two and seven. And he says, be not conformed, not to this earth, he says, to this matrix, but be ye. And, uh, man, I've got I to reveal this because the Holy Spirit really blew my mind as I was preparing for you. And, and you've always heard me teach this, my friend, that words that are separated in the word of God, thousands of years ago, most of these words, if not all, were interconnected. And this is Revelation, what I'm about to to tell uh, the saints tonight, because you already know this, Apostle, when we connect the terms or words B to the word ye, that term B A means a binary I. I, I I've got to say this again. That, that term B ye, when interconnected, it means B A, which is uh, a Latin word meaning uh, the I of the binary or the binary eye, which is a multi-platform, portable view of binary files with a built-in editor. Check this out. Uh, In other words, that through the Spirit of God, what Paul is saying, that uh, as Jesus had so powerfully articulated there in Matthew 6, 22, that the light of the body is the eye, or that binary light, which is Christ himself. And the Lord began to really break this down to me, man. I want to just pitch this to you and see what you thought about this. That the term I, uh, meaning the mind of God, the consciousness of who Jesus is, um, the binary I, or be ye, or be ye, of Romans 12 and 2. Now, in Matthew 6, 22, uh, the Apostle St. Paul is writing, but be ye transformed, okay? Uh, not conformity, but transformity by the renewing, okay, in, in Romans 12 and 2. Renewing, not of the human brain, my friend, but of the mind. And I'm going to say something. You already know this, man of God that um, the Lord said that the church is not being taught, some of the leadership, the church is not being taught uh, concerning the spirit of the mind. And um, one of the tragedies that I see in leadership today, men of God, that we are not teaching people how to think. And you know what the Lord told me today? He says, if we teach people how to think, they will find God. That's what he said. So he talks about to be ye transformed by the renewing. In other words, what Paul is saying, God wants us to renew a policy that we had in the pre-false state of Adam. Renewing. It's a policy that uh, talks about leadership a policy of renewing, which means if we are going to renew an entity, we had it in the beginning. Renewing, okay, our minds, but not the removing of our minds. And then uh, Jesus so powerfully articulated, and I'll get out of the way. I just wanted to see what you thought of this, man of God. There in Matthew 6, 22, he says, the light of the body is the eye, that binary eye, or your mind, the way that you and I and us uh, as a humanity is thinking. And he says, if therefore thine eye 
or the way that you're thinking, be single or one with Christ, thy whole body shall be full of light. But check this out, my friend. But if thine eye be evil, again, my friend, the Holy Spirit says to me today, uh, he says, Bishop, I want you to interconnect the words be and the word evil. When I connected these two words, it blew my mind, man of God, because it reveals also a Latin Vulgate expression, be evil or be deviled, which means to become triggered. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit. So what, what Jesus is saying in conjunction to what Paul said in Romans 12 and 2, Jesus is saying in Matthew 6, 23, if thine eye be evil or be triggered, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Now, it's interesting that um, in the New Testament Tanakh and also uh, in the Greek text, that term darkness, and, I'm, and you won't find that until our Global Spiritual Revolution partners, Apostle knows this, knows what I'm about to say, that you won't find this in the Strong's Concordness or any present-day Greek lexicon. But the term here, darkness, it means to be obsolete. So in other words, if thine eye be triggered, or another term for be dark or be evil, it means dark intellect. Hmm. So if thine eye be dark intellect, or is an entity of a dark intellect, an intellectual level. In other words, thy whole body or your conversation shall be full of darkness. Now, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness or be obsolete, how great is that darkness or how great is that obsolete? Man of God, again, you are opening up a well of revelation in me. Uh, what say you, man of God, as we're really, you're, you're just powerfully um, laying this foundation concerning leadership and training um, this present-day generation uh, of leaders? Well, Bishop, I have to be honest with you. I, I can't really touch what you said because I'm going to end off in a whole other world that I don't really want to touch. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just going to simply say that <laughs> we use the, yes. you use the term binary. The term binary means two things, binary, mm -hmm. okay? So in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, I don't know exactly where, but it's so much chapter 1, Paul makes mention of the eyes of your understanding being open, though being oh, dark. Yes. Remember that? The eyes of your understanding? So your yes. mind has an eye. <laughs> that is what the occult world calls the, your, your third eye. That's what the Buddha, I mean, the Buddhists and the, you know, all these people with the chakras and all this stuff, your, your, right. your mind, talk about your mind's eye. So when Jesus makes reference to that, he talks about the singleness. In other words, your two front eyes being binary and your third eye, they must be single. You, you follow what I'm saying? So in other words, your mm. mind's eye and your eyes on your <laughs> two front, on your face must be single. And if they are single, oh. then your body being full of light. Why is that important, listener? Because if I have three versus one, that if, if I have three of something, that means more, more, uh, 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 more information travels because it has three different passageways. But if I have one single way, one, one single, mm -hmm. that's why I said if your eye be single, I can flood light through that one specific place and it illuminates the body. But if I have three multiple places that, in, that information or light can go through, I'm like Swiss cheese. It may come in through <laughs> one, but it can go out the other. So, so I'm, I, oh my I'm, I'm going to leave that alone, my friend. I, I think you've, uh, oh. you've, you've <laughs> illuminated that. I'll just proceed to, to oh. finishing up the principles because you know we'll end up somewhere else, and I don't want to do that to the show. <laughs> and you know what, uh, you know what, my friend. And the th and the thing is too that that term, and I'll uh, touch this, and we'll move on to the next topic because it, it can take another uh, show really to talk about what we're talking about tonight. We have with us um, the Honorable Apostle J.R. Macklin, 
uh, a dear friend of mine and a colleague in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, a true 21st century apostle, 929-477-3997. Again, beloved, 929-477-3997. Leadership, uh, spiritual leadership and development in the 21st century church. Those terms, be darkness in Matthew 6.23. And it's like Apostle said, all of you students out there, make sure you have a pen and in, in, in a pad. Write down the term, be darkness. And I, I found out today, man of God, and this is revelation, and I'm saying to the saints that you're not going to find this anywhere, all right? Uh, the term, be darkness, if we interconnect those two New Testament words, uh, it really reveals the term spawn point. And I'm thinking, Holy Spirit, spawn point? What is a spawn? Remember there was a, many, some years ago, uh, there was a Marvel comic movie about spawn, a demon. So that term, be darkness, and interconnected, means not just spawn point, but the respawning of the soul or the repossession of, of the soul. I just wanted to point that out. Nine two nine four seven seven three nine nine seven. Leadership, uh, leadership, and spiritual development in the twenty first century church. Uh, Men of God, uh, leadership uh, is it the same uh, as servant leadership? Break that down for us. Concerning is leadership the same as servant leadership? As Saint Paul the Apostle considered himself a bond servant or a slave. Uh, what say you, my friend? Well, that's, I'm happy you asked that because it actually fits with the second of the three principles of leadership. It's example leadership. That's what mm-hmm. servanthood is. See, in order for you to serve someone, servanthood has to be learned. See, the word hood is added to it, my friend. Because it indicates mm. process. It indicates lifestyle, yes. servanthood, the priesthood, or, or, you know, it's the neighborhood. It's, in other words, it's neighbors in mm. a hood together. A hood is not necessarily a derogatory right. term. It actually means a gathering or a populace of, of you know, of gathering of people. So, so servanthood right. has to be learned. It's a, it's a process by which you learn. And so when Paul talks about that, Paul is indicating, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm so happy you're asking that question because <laughs> Paul yes. says something here that I think is important that, you, that your listeners catch. Number one, slaves must have a revelation that they're slaves. Mm. <laughs> See, <laughs> wow. The reason why this is important. Is wow. because Paul was the most intellectual teacher of New Testament theology other than Christ. No other yes. apostle could catch his, his intellectual acumen. So, so by that being the truth, Paul himself had to humble himself and acknowledge that he was a slave. When a person acknowledges that they are a slave, my friend, they are indicating to the one that they are a slave to or slave for Mm. that your intellect, your knowledge, (laughs) your understanding, your power, your might is stronger than mine. And as a result of that, I have renounced my former master. (laughs) <laughs> I renounce my, oh my former master, which <laughs> yes. is myself, and I now fall up under your slavery, your way of thinking. Mm-hmm. I am now, and this is what brings to mind the term yoke. Remember when Christ says, my yes. yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Greek word for yoke yes. is zugos. It means bondage. In other words, now, now, listen to me, listeners. Right. I want you to hear me clearly. That means that you're always going to be in bondage. It just determines who's the slave master of your bondage. I want, I want you listeners mm. to let that sleep in. <laughs> you, in other Come words, you are either a slave to God through Christ, 
or a slave to Satan through the world and sin. Either way, oh we goodness. are human beings who live, who are spirits. We are spirits who have bodies, who have souls, and we are designed to be inhabited by a spirit. And if we are designed to be inhabited by a spirit, we are also designed to be led by one. So you can be led right. by the spirit of God or you can be led by the spirit of the world, but both of them have a yoke. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Keep in mind, he says his bondage is easy and his burdens are light. Both, what I want you to listen to understand, my friend, is that he didn't say you didn't have burdens. He didn't say right. <laughs> that it was easy. He's telling you that my burden and my yoke is easier than the other guys. Very important. Okay. So that being said, every slave has got to record. Oh, oh. so you know what? I, I got to say this. For those who don't believe what I'm saying, does the scripture say that he will not put on you more than you should bear? Right. Doesn't the scripture say that he was tempted at all points like we were, like we were, yet without sin? Yes. So yes, in sir. other words, the same vicissitudes of life, the same issues you will have in life, Christ himself went through them, and he himself has the ability to provide for you a way of escape. But he did not say that the burden would go away. He gives you the ability to Handle it. So Paul mm. recognizes he gets a revelation of slavery, hmm. and he realizes that I am a slave to Christ. He owns me. I'm, I'm speaking in layman's term, and I'm and I'm. Uh, he, he's basically saying, and I'm, I'm gonna say it parenthetically. He's basically saying, guess what? I'm a slave to him. He's stronger yes. than me. He's more powerful than me. He's wiser than me. And because he's wiser than me it leads to the next thing that Paul recognized. He, he, he had a revelation of being a slave to Christ, but then he in turn recognized his, his, his position in him. Brothers and sisters, right. if you're in any leadership position in the kingdom of God, even though I am an apostle and my friend here is a bishop, we are still slaves. We recognize yeah. our place in the hierarchy of the kingdom. It's a, it is a hierarchy. Every kingdom has a hierarchy, if you're listening to that. So, so in other words, we have to recognize that we're slaves. And the only reason why I say recognition after revelation, my friend, because Paul says something. Oh, I'm getting stirred up. I'm going to try to keep it. I, ahead, I, what ahead, I'm about to say. No, 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 no. Because no. that, that, that scripture just popped in my head. Paul says that he yeah. revealed his son in me. When, when, when he oh, begins to reveal his son, Son in you, mm. all of a sudden you recognize who you are. You recognize your position. You recognize that you know nothing. Yes. You don't have nothing. It doesn't matter how many. You can have more degrees than a the thermometer. It doesn't matter. You can you can know more people than 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 the heavens themselves. If you have not had Jesus revealed in you, that's right. You have no understanding of what it means to be a slave. And that's why you want to be worshipped as a leader, because you have not had him revealed in you to understand that you own nothing. The people in our fellowship, I own none of them. They don't work for me. They work with me. We all work for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I think that way because, like Paul said, he, he, he revealed his son in me. And when he reveals his son in you, all of a sudden, Bishop, you say, hold on. If this person wants to leave our <laughs> church, let them leave. That's right. Go ahead and leave. I don't own them. <laughs> if you want to resign your position, <laughs> by all means, let me support you in this endeavor. I don't own you. When we mm. begin to realize that, somebody asked me uh, the other day, like, you just, like, so, you had, you had some stuff that, you know, dealing with some ministry stuff. And somebody said, you're so nonchalant about this. And I said to him, because they don't belong to me. I don't own nobody. I'm a slave like them. And some of them choose to go back to the slave master of the world. But at the end of the day, mm. we're all slaves to something. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. And so 
the the, yes. the, the, the leader must recognize his positioning in the world. I don't care who you are listening tonight. You're a slave. I'm a slave. And the moment yeah. you recognize that, you're because see, this is what my friend, this is what Satan is spending overtime. He's working, Come he's working now. long hours. Yes. See, this is what he's doing. That's it. If he can make you fall in love with the knowledge of the world and make you think that you're something, that's what these mystery schools are about. That's what all these secret societies and these fraternities, all of them are trying to explain to you that you have some type of, they have some true esoteric knowledge and power that feeds to the flesh of man. Those of you who don't believe, go back to the book of Genesis when Satan offered them the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, all of it's shaped around that. But what, but, but what Paul recognized that listen y'all I'm I'm a slave to this 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 Jesus this this yes. this, this 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 man who was here on earth but now he reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords I'm I'm a slave to him and when people yes. recognize that when they understand my friend that they are slaves they will understand that leadership must be exampled mm. see. <laughs> But, um, John, in, the, in the Gospel of John, <laughs> stop me whenever, you, whenever you need to, Bishop. But in John chapter five, I want to bring your listeners to this. Jesus says something yes. so profound. He says, and he answered, and, and then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he see of the Father. Mm. Now, listeners. I want you to pay special attention to the style of leadership and where the origin of spiritual (laughs) leadership came from. Jesus is indicating to us that he learned what he learned from what he saw his father do. Now watch this, brothers and sisters. If Jesus had to learn from his father, then why do we think we don't have to learn from Jesus. Oh, my goodness. He's <laughs> I'm, my say it. I'm okay. I'm okay. 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 <laughs> he said, it. very, yeah. very, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. The term likewise indicates the exact same thing. It indicates right. pattern. It indicates emulation. But this is what's interesting, my friend. The Apostle Paul writes that we should not emulate anyone. Mm-hmm. But Jesus says, doeth the Son likewise. You know why? Because God is not, he's not anyone. <laughs> he right. All yeah. things. So what happens is, in order for you to lead successfully in, in, in a spiritual leadership position, because the church is spiritual, I'm still, you know what, my friend, I'm still looking to see a physical church. I haven't seen one yet. I haven't yes, seen yes. it yet. I haven't seen it yet. I'm still trying to find it. Maybe you can show it to me. But, but, but anyway, he, he says, <laughs> he says <laughs> so in other words, you, when the, the church being a spiritual entity, and I think this is where, uh, 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 others, you know, sometimes that sometimes we make a mistake as leaders in the body is that we, because we're in the world, my friend, and we're not of the world. Sometimes we let being in the world affect not being of the world. <laughs> in other words, we 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 have it. We, we we get so fixated on doing it here and not understanding that how we do it here shapes where we go when we leave here. So in right. other words, I have to I have to lead from heaven, brothers and sisters. That's what I'm trying to say. You have to lead from heaven's perspective, not from the earth's perspective. So in other words, even though some of these things that we see are are effective, my friend, it doesn't mean. For example, we can have the the seeker friendly style. We can have the smoke and the dark clouds and and the dancer. Right. And we can do all, all that <laughs> stuff. But 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 my my point is, none of those things are effective in heaven. I know I, I probably okay. made some approaches okay. mad from saying that. <laughs> now, now, I didn't say Jeez. apostle or pastor. I didn't say that they were wrong. I said they're not effective in heaven. Oh, that doesn't mean anything because we ain't in heaven. Oh, my. You're wrong. Right. Paul says you are seated in heavenly places. 
In other words, mm. your citizenship is in the heavens. You just passing through here. So what you're doing here is echoed in the heavens. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's critiquing right. you. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. So you're not just doing what you're doing here just because. It doesn't just because. Oh, God. So, so in other words, oh, on, we yeah. have to lead from heaven. We lead from heaven. Mm-hmm. And how we lead from heaven, Jesus gives an example in John chapter 5. We, Jesus led from heaven. He came from heaven. The Father showed him things, and he came to earth. And did, now, Bishop, can I, can I have a little phone with this for a second, if you don't mind? Go ahead, go ahead. And the Holy Spirit just, just, just brought this to my attention. Now, what's interesting was yeah. Jesus was here on earth when he said that, right? Yeah. So let me ask you a question, my friend. What did God do on earth that Jesus saw? <laughs> Oh Lord, have mercy! I don't want anybody. Oh. I, don't, I don't want you to answer it. I just want to. Oh Lord, have mercy. I just want to throw this oh, out this to your good. listener. So, 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 what did what did God? Because wow. I'm gonna tell you, because because he don't have no body physically, right? So, so what did oh, so so Lord. now? And what did Jesus do? He healed the sick. He he cleansed people. Yeah. He delivered them. He set them free, and he died for them. So. When Jesus indicates that what he's now doing and what he's seen the Father do, doesn't that say a lot about the Father? And doesn't that also bring, in, bring into illumination who the Father really is? Mm. So, so, so I just want to drop that mic and let, let people oh. just think about that for a second. But, but so, so it's example leadership, my friend. Leadership has to be example. The, 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 the last principle, my friend, to leadership, the lead, leadership. We talked about spirit led. We talked about example, example leadership. The last one that I want people to really, really get, Bishop, and I think this is important. It's instructive and developmental principle. Mm-hmm. Let me say that again. Yes. Instructive and developmental. In other words, do you guys remember? I'm mean, listeners. I'm sorry. Let me. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm acting like I'm talking <laughs> to them face to face. I apologize. So do you you remember, listeners, how in Mark chapter 3, when the scripture talked about how Jesus ordained the 12? Do you remember that, Bishop? Ah, teach my problem. Yes. Okay, now now what's interesting is, is that how long he was with the disciples, my friend? What, three and a half years? Three and a half years, that's it. Uh Uh-huh. And you notice that in our current church structure, man, I know I'm going to make some people mad about this. Lord, forgive me. Go ahead, go ahead. In our, in, in our current church structure, we are teaching people that you – ordaining people after being with them for a very long time. Mm. But did you notice that Jesus newly knew them and he ordained them? Did you catch that, my friend? Mm. Oh, my Lord. No, no, no. No, no. See, I told you. I wow. Told you. No, no, watch this right. Here. I want to, I, I want to show you something that, that that this is. Remember when we talked about this some time ago, and I told you Holy Spirit gave me this. And one of the things that jumped yes. out to me was the way Jesus did things. See, we skipped that. We got to pay attention to the way He did things. You know why He ordained them, Bishop? Even though they didn't know much of Him, you know why? Because ordaining someone doesn't give them authority. It gives them access to learn of the authority. Mm. Let, me, let, me, let me say that again. Let me say that again. Mm. When you are the way Jesus did it, the way Jesus did it. Oh, my Lord. Lord. I, I, I apologize if I call it so. <laughs> no, no. I want you, I want, no, no. Wow. Think about it. They watched him cast out devils. They watched him mm-hmm. do all these things. But, but, but what's interesting is, he ordained them before he sent them out. Hmm. Wow. So, so, so hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so hold on. For a <laughs> so Jesus Christ gave people position before he gave them power? Oh, God. Oh, my goodness. Teach my father. So hold on. Hold Break on, that hold down. On, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Why would yeah. Jesus do that? Why would you do wow. that? 
Because if you are a true spiritual leader, you are recognizing that every person that you lead develops at a different speed and a different pace. And so you have Mm -hmm. to put them in positions to fail and be successful in order for them to grow to the maturity that they're supposed to be. That's why he would chastise Peter, but he had nothing to say to nobody else. Because Jesus knew (laughs) that Peter was going to be something that the other ones wasn't going to be. Oh, my God. That's why it has to be spiritual leadership. Now, now, let me just be clear. Apostles and pastors, you do what you want to do. I'm just telling you Mm. what I know about the leadership style of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that this is monolithic. Do what you want to do. But let every man build his house. You know, the way, let him build it on Christ. Yeah. Every man work will, will be tested by fire and the day shall declare it. But anyway, so, so my, my point is, is that the word, and this is another thing I want to bring up about this ordainment, Bishop, is that yes. you notice the Greek word for ordainment has the word tithe in it. Did you know that ordain mm-hmm. is uh, wow. I? No, no, no. This is what I, this is what the Holy Spirit showed me, and, and I and and, <laughs> and I really want people to understand this. Too. Man, yes. I'm going I'm, I'm going to make some people so mad, Bishop. I apologize. Take your time. Take your time. Go ahead, Apostle. Teach. Do you know? A long time ago, I when I was pastoring in Maryland, I, I had a conversation with with one of the brothers in our ministry. And I remember telling him, he was asking me, he said, well, why don't you ask for a tithe and all this other stuff and blah, 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 and how we just had like a, a bowl in the back, right? And we would just like give. And I would never take time to, to have a moment where people give in the service. And he didn't quite understand it. So I explained to him, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying, I said to him what I'm going to say to you right now. Yeah. The seed, the, when we talk about sowing and reaping, and you and you listen to the, I'm going to bring it back together, so relax. I'm not going off into money cometh on you. I'm not going <laughs> But but, but 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 let me ask you a question, listener. Yes. When we talk about sowing, who has more power? The field that it's sown into or the sower? Who mm. owns the field? <laughs> See, oh <my laughs> the God. one who owns Jeez. the field field has the most power. In other words, okay. my, my fellow clergy, the field <laughs> belongs to God. Yes. He sends people to take their seed, not no watch this, themselves. <laughs> the biggest seed oh you can ever get is yourself. You take yourself and you plant it the hard right. ground. See, why does Jesus, do you notice Jesus didn't say money was the harvest? He said the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are fruit. But he's talking about money or he's talking about people. Right. <laughs> so what happens is yeah. you yourself, you, now watch this, my, my brothers and sisters who listen to me tonight. Don't get me wrong. We need money to get this done. Hear me clearly. But we have got it backwards, my bishop. We are asking people for their money without asking for their soul. Ooh. No, no, this is, 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 uh, hear me clearly. (laughs) I'm talking about instructive and 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 developmental principles of leadership. Jesus ordains these men who don't know anything about him. They know a little bit about him. They know he's the son of God. They know all this other stuff. But he has not breathed on them the Holy Spirit. In John chapter five, correct me if I'm wrong, my bishop. He, mm, I mean, I'm, I'm mm, in, 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 in Mark chapter Mark chapter three. The Holy Spirit didn't come yet, right? You're teaching. Okay, That's okay, right. okay. So, 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 so Jesus ordains these men with them not having the Holy Spirit within them. You know why he did it? Because his ultimate harvest is to get them to be in his program. Every leader has a program. The program is what turns them into the harvest. 
Oh, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying tonight. Oh, teach, teach. The, 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 the program of walking with your apostle, walking with your bishop, walking with your pastor, that's the program. And you come into yes. the program, and your biggest investment, your biggest harvest leader, and your biggest seed saint is to throw yourselves into the program. Because this is why the apostolic church is right. Because Paul says that we all come to the unity of the faith. And that's why he gave the fivefold to do what? For the perfecting of the saints, right? Well, perfection yes. means that it's a process, perfecting. But if you're not in the program, you cannot be perfected. And if you do not give them access to you, leader, you don't have a position of teacher in order to perfect. How can you perfect someone that you don't know? Oh, my God. Can I say this? So what Jesus... Oh, go ahead, my God. Go ahead. Go, forgive me for coming. Please forgive me. Uh, uh, please forgive me. I, uh, again, God is speaking to you so powerfully, but you, you have such a high level of of the anointing and what, what I call detail. And, and the scripture that came to my mind in, in Mark uh, 3, 14, uh, and it says, and he ordained 12. It didn't say that they should go forth and preach. <laughs> he ordained 12 that they should be with him. Man of God, I, I've been in ministry for going on 36 years. What you said, I have never heard before. I, I, the Word of God, the Bible, is the only book in history that you cannot master. You can read it a million times and learn something different the, the next day. He didn't ordain them to preach first or to teach or to cast out devils, Mark 3, 12, uh, Mark 3, 14. But they were ordained. And that term ordination also has a root meaning not just to separate or to set apart, but it also means ordinary. Now, why did he choose 12 of the most intellectual men in Palestine or in Israel? In other words, he chooses 12 empty cups or empty glasses. They don't know anything about the systematic theology. They don't know anything about any seminary or rabbinical work or education so that he could pour himself into them. He ordains them that they should be with him first and that he might. Now, wait a minute now here. Why would the scripture say in Mark 3 and 14 that, that, that he might send them forth to preach? Many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, there is a process, correct me if I'm wrong, Apostle, there is a, a divine process between the call to one being chosen, and that's a process that very few can even accomplish. In other words, he ordains them that they should develop a relationship. He's not even talking about preaching or teaching or pastoring or being an apostle. No, 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 because in Luke 6 and 13, and when it was day, he called unto him his, not just apostles first, he calls them into a discipline. And this is where we get the term uh, disciple, not just a follower of Christ, one who is disciplined. Help me, Holy Spirit. He, they, he, they're called into a discipline that they might be sent forth into an apostolic. In other words, the reason why so many are failing in the apostolic, my friend, because they have not mastered themselves through the art of discipline. I'll say this and get out of the way, and please forgive me for, for cutting you off a few minutes ago, my friend. Please forgive me. But Alexander the Great once said, I have conquered the world. But guess what else he said, uh, my friend? But I could not conquer myself. 
In other words, he ordains them to become his discipline. So he chooses 12 different men with 12 different personalities. He's not going to speak to Andrew like he speaks to Peter. He's not going to speak to John as he speaks to Thomas. He's not going to speak to Thomas as he speaks to Nathaniel or Bartholomew. See, this is wisdom here. In other words, the master calls them to be ordained into a spiritual relationship, one, into a spiritual covenant, two, which brings them into a level of intimacy. To be what? To be a disciple or one who has the power or the mastery to discipline. And of them, he chose 12. It didn't say he calls 12. I'm talking about Luke 6 and 13. I'm just going by the word. He chooses 12 only because he ordains the 12 to be with him. And I'm going to say this, and I promise I'm going to get out of the way. Man, if I, you get a nerd with me. Oh, my Lord Jesus. When you said in Matthew, when Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn to me, he said, for my yoke is easy. In what, Matthew chapter uh, 11, verse 30? I'm reading from the King James Version. For my yoke, yoke, that term yoke means a pattern. I think I touched on this last night when we talked about spiritual discernment. There's a difference between um, being equally yoked and unequally yoked. Christ does not call 12 men whose emotional pattern doesn't match him. Oh, Apostle, you got to hold me back. He doesn't call the intellectual of those of the high society of the of the intelligentsia rabbinical order of that day. He doesn't call anyone from the same hedron or from the rabbinic. He calls 12 men, 11 of which are fishermen and a tax collector, okay, and a doctor, and one who became a devil. But he says here in Matthew 11.30, for my yoke or my pattern." There's a pattern is easy. It's easy because it's the pattern that matches the pattern of who he is, my friend. For my yoke or pattern is easy and my burden. Notice in the King James Version, my friend. It doesn't say that my burden is light, L-I-T-E, as in weight. <laughs> But it says L-I-G-H-T as the illumination. So then in Genesis 1 and 3, and correct me for wrong, man of God. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And, and, and what I'm about to say, I'm going to get in trouble, and there's going to be pastors. There's going to be emailing us tonight and for the rest of the week. I don't care. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God never, let me repeat this again. God never created the light. In other words, why would God need to create an entity that is himself? God did not need to create himself. God is the light, and in him there is no darkness or oscillation at all. In other words, when he's talking about let there be light, which corresponds to uh, Matthew 11 and 30, he says, I'm going to allow a part of my character to be ordained, there you go, into a terra firma that has now fallen because of the fall of Lucifer between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to allow a part of my nature to be bathed in a territory that was called the earth, but is now called the world, because the world is the black, backslidden state of the earth. In other words, and I'm going to say this, and please, and please uh, rebuke me if I'm wrong. The only way that ministers can be true leaders, the most, uh, the deeper the servitude, 
I want everyone to write this. Apostles know this. Know this. The deeper the servitude, the higher the leadership. In other words, the level of one servitude, my apostle, will determine the level of one's leadership. Uh, am, am I correct in saying this, my friend? Yes, yes. But now this is see, you always cause the trouble. <laughs> then yes. the the question <laughs> is, what is servitude? Uh, see, you, you see, see. It depends on your <laughs> definition of servitude. Yes. Because mm, I like it. If you have the world's version of servitude, mm-hmm. now you have corporate style ministry, pay for play, that type of stuff. But if you have leadership style of servitude, mm-hmm. that's where you are. You're talking. See, see, this is what I've learned, my friend. I, I, I'm the, the Lord has gifted me to teach, and so I always think in teaching yes. perspective. But I have that mindset. So one of the things that yes, I, I, I think that we should we should never take make for granted that people have the same definition as I do. I never do that. So I always try to figure out what their definition is, the definition is, or I have to give them a definition. Because what's happening right. is there's two versions of church. There's two versions of Jesus. There are two versions of everything. The scriptures declare that all through the New Testament. There's going to be different versions of this, different versions of that. And a person's version of something determines their perspective. So you and I are on the same sheet by what you're saying, but maybe somebody who's listening to us may not have that perspective. See, their version of servitude might be their apostle being carried around in a gold chair from his car. You follow me? So, 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 I'm I'm, I'm not not being facetious. I'm I'm, I'm just simply saying definitions mean things. A person's understanding illuminates a lot for you when you when you're when you're trying to get to know them or or, or share some revelation truth with them. You have to know from where right. they came from. And that's why Jesus right. ordained them because they walked mm-hmm. with him. He knew them. He talked with them. And, and and those who are listening to me who are saying that's crazy way of thinking, well, just like you had people in your church that did you dirty and left, so did Jesus Judas do that mm-hmm. to Jesus. Mm. So, so it's a, it, you see what I'm saying? It's a part of That's the good. process of development, instructive development. He turns around, Bishop, and then he he sends them out two mm. by two. Now, 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 I'm, a, I'm an old military, I'm an old military man, but I, I want to, you, you notice in the military when we send people out two by two, they call that back in the day buddy teams. You know why they send uh-huh. you in buddy teams? Because you're not mature enough to do it by yourself. So what was Jesus oh really goodness. doing? He was training them. He was preparing them. He was actually, it was a student-teacher moment. He was basically sending them out. And, and, and I want to bring this to your listeners' uh, uh, attention here. And, and, and I, yes. <laughs> because you, you sure. notice how the scripture talks about how he gave them authority now, I, I want everybody yes. to, to really pay attention to our Lord and our King <laughs> to prove to you Good. that he was, he was taking them on a field trip. It was a field trip. It was a spiritual field trip. Yes. He gave them something that they had never had the ability to do before. Mm-hmm. They watched him do it. They witnessed him do it. And the military is called train the trainer. The person who trained yes. you, the person who's now training, he's, he's now training you. So what, what he did was he let them, and I'm going to prove to everybody tonight that Jesus, why Jesus ordained them. They watched him cast out devils, do all this stuff. And not any time did he let them do it. But they were ordained. <laughs> he ordained them. <laughs> So they could watch him do it. And so he oh, was showing Lord, them. Mercy. Are he, you following what I'm saying? Oh he was showing God, them revelation. by through instructive development. 
that I'm going to see. This is what I'm saying. This is Mm. why an apostle, you know why an apostle has to be able to cast out devils and do all that stuff? Because the apostle is the one that sets doctrine. Yeah. Uh, the do- yeah, 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 you got it, my friend. You got what I'm saying. <laughs> so in other words, the yeah. doctrine has to be based upon Christ. So what did yeah. Christ do? Cast out devils, heal the sick, signs, miracles, and wonders, right? Because in yeah. order for you to give someone authority to do something, you would have had to have done it yourself, Yes. So in other yes. So in other words, when Jesus Christ was having them watch, do, do you know? Let me let me do it. Let me digress for a second. You ever heard of um, ahead, uh, uh, Pythagoras? Pythagoras. Yeah. Came up with the pack of, uh, the theory. He was like a he was like a one of those. Uh, he was a he was nasty, but he was a genius. Yeah. And um, right. do you know those who who he, he's rules? He's, he's like the father of mathematics back in the old world. Um, he was also, mm. anyway, he was a pervert too. But anyway, he, Pythagoras, yeah. where, where our children learned of the Pythagorean theory, Pythagoras had this thing, Bishop, where when you became his student, do you know you were not allowed to talk for years? Wow. Oh, my goodness. And guess what? Not only could you not talk while you wow. were in his presence, but more importantly, my friend, you couldn't even tell anybody that you was ever in his presence. So now watch this. Mm, mm, so people mm. would see you wearing a cloak, and only people who were in his, in his fellowship wore this specific garb. But you couldn't tell people that you was with them, even though they're the only ones that wore it. And then on top of that, you couldn't even talk to him. Meanwhile, he was always talking to you. So in other words, Pythagoras never asked questions. He always gave orders. Thus, the root word ordain order in ordained. A person who is ordained oh. is a person who is being trained to take orders. In other words, oh Jesus Lord. Christ ordained them before he gave miracles mm. and power and authority to them because he was teaching them how to get it done. And by teaching them how to get them done, he gave them orders. An order is not something you have to say, you will do this. No. By the mere fact that he says, the scripture says that he gave them authority to cast out devils. Thus the term authority has the term author in the root word. In other words, he's the originator of that power. So because he's the originator of that power, he has the ability to give him the authority. And they got the authority by being ordained in his program and watching him. But if they were not ordained, my friend, they could have never had access to the power. See, this is what I mean. He's a genius. The whole time, Bishop, he had these men with him. Think about it. He he, 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 he knows they're fishermen. He knows they're tax collectors. He knows all of that. He let them follow him around. He tells Peter, he said, listen, you come with me, I'll make you fishermen of men. He used a principle of identifying the strength in Peter. Oh, yes. He (laughs) identified the strength in Peter not to to tell Peter that you're going to be great. No, 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 no. He wanted Peter to know that I'm watching you, that I know Mm. you. I know who you are, and therefore, by telling Peter who he are, who he was at that time, he was indicating to Peter that I have something better than what you are right now. That's why relationship is important. So for every Christian listening to me today, if you have a leader in the house of God and you don't know who they are, shame on you. If you are a leader oh and boy. don't know who the people are, Shame on you because you yeah. are the key to tapping what's inside of them. You're supposed to look into them. That's why the sermon is important. You have to look into the soul by the Spirit of God and say, I see you. I know you're a tax collector, but we're about to collect some souls today. I know you're a oh, fisherman, Lord, but I got something better for you. That's what leadership in the spiritual realm is. Seeing beyond my behavior, oh, God, 
seeing beyond the bad decisions that they made, seeing beyond where they came from. They may have been raped and molested and rejected, but if you are a true spiritual leader, you have the ability because your father, your savior, your God did it. You have the same ability to look beyond their bad decisions, beyond their past, reach into the realm of the spirit and identify them for who God says they are. Oh, why do you do that? Then that's why you can ordain somebody even though they are lost as a ball in high weeds. You can ordain yeah. them even though they don't know nothing. You know why? Because you can yeah. look inside and say, there is something in you that you don't even know yet. You don't that's even know. That's why Jesus that's ordained it. them. These ordained these oh, cats, they ain't know nothing. They were still wrapped around the Jewish feast and all this other stuff. Jesus like, man, y'all come with me. Hang out with me. I got something I want to show you. And because of that, my friends. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. My friends, I, I, I got to say, oh, no. Oh, God. I, my mind is blown and reblown and reblown again. When, I, when it seems like my mind is being put back together, you reblow it again. Man of God, again, you come into my apostolic uh, treasure box here. Uh, 929 Leadership. Uh, this great apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and I are discussing uh, spiritual leadership and spiritual development in the 21st century church. You may mention he sent them out two by two. I, I remember years ago speaking at a conference many years ago in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, my God, back in was it, 2004. Um, I was speaking on that very same topic uh, that concerning two, and, two by two in Mark 6 and 7 and Luke 10 and 1. Uh, and, there, and I want to touch on this, and I, I want to see what you think, man, of God, because, again, you've hit another powerful apostolic nerve. Why two by two? Um, Mark 6 and 7, and he called unto him, the 12, and began to send them forth by two and two. Now, it's interesting for those of you, um, and Apostle already knows this, what I'm about to say, but uh, those of you who know the uh, Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 distinct letters within the Hebrew alphabet. Again, there are 22 distinct letters within the Hebrew alphabet. But he sends them forth two by two. Not just a representation of the Torah of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, but also a representation of of the physical cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, two by two. The vertical bar representing our relationship with Christ, the horizontal bar representing our relationship with each other, two and two. In other words, he sends them out in six sets of two, six sets of two. Man created on the sixth day, sends them out in sets of six, two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirit. Spirit. And notice that's the 12, but the 70 in Luke 10 and 1, it says after these things, he appointed the 70. Uh, he calls the 12, but he appoints the 70. Uh, why would he call the 70? Because the 70 are the spiritual sons of the 12. Help me, Dr. Macklin. In other words, he sends the 12 out in sets of six, but he sends the 70 out, my friend, in sets of 35. The number 35, and, and again, I don't want to get off into Hebrew numerology and all that. Other stuff. In Hebrew gematria, the term gematria means numbering system. And so that every number in the Word of God has a spiritual sequence when understanding who Christ is. But the number six is a, is a number of man, but the number of 35, the number of 35 is a number of a spiritual awakening. He sends the, the 12 out in six in sets of six. He sends the 70 out in Luke 10 and 1 in sets of 35. Before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. And that really fulfills and corresponds, my friend, what you said. And, and I believe on last night, and I'm going to say this and get out of the way, but we're going to get to the next topic. Oh, I'm excited here. Leadership, uh, as uh, Apostle J.R. Macklin and I are uh, discussing spiritual leadership and development in the 21st century church. 
uh, th- there is a uh, um, a medical term which I didn't say last night, but let me let me get to what I said last night, and then I'll get to this medical term. And and this is the reason why what you said, I believe, man of God, I believe one billion percent what you said that Jesus was a genius. But this term here, these three terms of um, insight, okay, actually four terms: insight, sight. Then the word sight, S-I-T-E, and then the oversight. Let me say it again. We're talking about leadership, uh, discussing an, an examination of spiritual leadership and development in the 21st century church. There's insight, my friend. Christ gives them insight. Then he gives them sight, S-I-G-H-T. Then he sends them to a location or a territory of sight, S-I-T-E, in order to give them the oversight. But we got leaders in the 21st century church, my friend, who have been given the oversight of a particular ministry and assignment, but they're operating from a foundation of blindness. They have no insight, no sight, and they've been sent to the wrong site in order to give oversight. I just wanted to point that out, my friend, because again here, and we're talking about leadership. And, and here's the med- med- medical term. I've said this, oh, my God, many times in our past broadcasts. This medical term, and the Lord spoke to me today, this term of neuroplasticity. And to our, um, our rabbinical students, our apostolic students, write it down, apostle note this. But neuroplasticity is a medical term stating that the human brain and mind grows into the shape and the size of what the individual is thinking at that moment. So it it had, I'm saying that to say this, my apostle, when Christ calls these 12 men, and you talked about Peter and, and, and Jesus saying, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. In other words, Christ speaks to them in a language that they, that they fully understand that is rooted in the career. In other words, uh, uh, this neuro, there's an apostolic neuroplasticity that for those three and one half years of training and development, the human brain in the mindset of these 12, actually 11 minus the devil, uh, begins to grow into the shape of the brain in thought of their master. Uh, what's that, you, man of God? I'm telling you, man of God, you blow my mind again as we're talking about leadership. And uh, uh, what is your thoughts on what I just said before we get to the well, next topic? Well, well, I believe you're right because Jesus said, the words I speak to you are life. So, in other words, he, the words that he's saying are, is laced with something that we cannot see but that we can only experience. Oh, my. Um, I liken it to, you know, um, I'm, I'm an Apple guy. I have an iPhone, and I have the ability to ask Siri, if I hear a song that I like, I can say, Siri, yes. what is that song? And she has the capability, mm. it's not her per se, to hear the song and tell me what it is. Now, we think that's so deep, but what it is is the song has a serial number. It's laced with something. The song has information <laughs> coded into it. Oh, Lord have mercy. And so it's the same for the, for the mm. words that the Lord speaks. That's why you yeah. can't take for granted the word of God, the rhema of God, and the logos of God. Mm. When something is spoken by, by that's God-breathed, that's why, that's why when the scripture says the word of God is God-breathed. When it is breathed yes. by God, that means it has Life in it, life upon life upon life upon life. That means it begins as one thing, it becomes it becomes something else, then it becomes something else. It's perpetual. It grows in a continuum. Mm. That's why we're still preaching something that Jesus said over two thousand some years ago, and it still has life, and people's lives are still being transformed by it. Yeah. So I, I concur. I concur. And again, and again, with the man of God, you're blowing, you are blowing my mind. We are, are um, so ever so blessed to be sitting at the seat 
of the Honorable Apostle J.L. Macklin, leadership, spiritual leadership and development uh, here in the 21st Century Church, here and only here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Um, the apostolic model of leadership, my friend, versus the current church model leadership, I break these two entities down. Um, the difference or the differentiation or the distinction between apostolic model leadership versus the current church model leadership of today? Well, um, the, 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 the current church model is basically there is a, a pastor um, who is by definition a shepherd. A mm-hmm. shepherd um, does not provide doctrine according to the word of God. A pastor takes care of the sheep. Um, and so mm-hmm. what's happened is, is that, or, or let, me, let me get a little more clear. It's, it's a pastor-led model. And what happens is it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's been effective for, you know, for a certain time. Um, yes. But the apostolic model is led by apostles, which is how the church was originally formed. It was formed through apostles. And then through apostles, mm-hmm. doctrine was given. Then there was teachers and evangelists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the difference in leadership styles or the way leadership is is that the apostolic model church is a um, developmental team concept versus mm-hmm. pastor-led church is more of a, okay, okay, here we go. I'll give it to you, something your listeners can relate to. How about this? And I know, you, I know, I know you'll love this, Bishop. <laughs> the... <laughs> The oh, Apostolic Lord. Church is the Cleveland – I'm sorry, the, the, the pastor-led church. The current model church is LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers. The Apostolic mm. Church is the Golden State Warriors. The Golden State yeah, Warriors I like have five people that could destroy you and make mm. your mm. team mm. want to quit. LeBron yes. James was by himself. He had to do all the shooting. He had to do all the scoring. <laughs> had to do right. all the rebounds. He had to do everything. But the apostolic model church that's, 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 that's identified to us in Ephesians, where Paul says that they're all the, are, are for, the, for the perfecting of the saints. Mm-hmm. And so they come together. So you have the apostle. You have the prophet. You have the apostle who, who leads and, and has the ability to, 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 to do a lot of amazing stuff that Christ did. The, 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 the prophet has the ability to speak from the mouth of God, not money, from the, about the, the things right. that, the, that God wants the person to know on, yeah. and which direction that the church, the, the specific body should be going into. Okay? Mm-hmm. Then after that, you have the evangelist. The evangelist is the one that funnels souls to the body. Let me say that again. The evangelist mm. funnels souls to the body to guess what? To get the apostles' doctrine, to see miracles, signs, and wonders, yes. and to ensure that so- the prophet has someone that they need to speak to. So in other words, Joe Ray Ray comes off the street. The evangelist had spoken somewhere. The evangelist yeah. says, you need to come to our local assembly. The person comes mm. to the local assembly. When they get to the local assembly, there is a prophet in the house. There is a strong chance that the prophet may have a word from God for that person. Then that person yeah. gets that word. Then the person also gets the doctrine, and the person may get, the, may get delivered and so on. Then that person is now introduced to the pastor who is fourth in the equation. The pastor is then responsible to ensure that that person is taken care of, that that person is being fed both spiritually and physically, make sure their family is straight. They are the ones who are, are, are protecting, the, they are shepherding the people, okay? Then afterwards, the last one, after you have the pastor, then you have the teacher. 
the teacher, in turn, is responsible for teaching the apostles' doctrine, for ensuring that the person who, Joe, who come off the street, Joe Ray Ray, Joe Ray Ray is taught, <laughs> is trained, is mature, is right. given information. Now, the old model church is the one where one person, you come there, and that one person is saying he or she is doing everything. Right. Two different mm-hmm. things. Right. So, and I believe that's one of the reasons why, um, and, and I know some people get offended by this, but I don't mean it in, in any, with any um, angst or, or animosity. That's why there's not a lot of men in the body. Because oh, men don't like, you got to remember, you're a man, I'm a man. We know a con game when we see it, right? That's it. That's it. So when you, oh, there you go. So, so, so you are more as a man. You're more apt to be committed to something when you see that the person in charge is sharing responsibility, versus when you come mm-hmm. to something and you see one person running a show and you go, you know what, this joker right here, right? You know, he's trying to get off. So that's just it's dealing with the psych. And God knew that. So he put he wants a team mm-hmm. to lead and build the church versus one yes. person trying to take on that responsibility. And more importantly, Satan loves that because he loves divide and conquer. So if he can have one person trying to do everything by himself, he loves it. That's why people need all these these breaks and take off and, and all this other stuff. And when they leave, right. the church falls under and all this other stuff because Satan loves that. So he'll beat that one man of God down, beat him to a pulp like he's chopped liver. Yeah, and then the man right. will eventually just quit. Man of God, I I am so excited. I I am bursting with apostolic joy because, again, the apostolic model. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the apostolic model is not being taught, but because I do not think, my friend. That the average preacher, I'm not saying, what I'm about to say, I'm not saying every single preacher uh, has this mindset. But I, I believe there is a big percentage of, uh, of the leadership, the ecclesiastical order, not just here in the Western Hemisphere, but around the world, they have no ideal, no inkling of what the apostolic module is for the 21st century. Manica, if I can just uh, just you know show one scripture with your permission and get out of the way. There in, in what? The Gospel according to St. Sure. John chapter 1. Uh, again, the, and I love what you said some minutes ago. Jesus, Jesus Christ was a genius. Uh, St. John chapter 1, uh, verse number 38. Then Jesus turned and saw, you know, like I love taking words and spelling them from right to left because Hebrew is written from right to left. Jesus turned and saw a was then following. Mm. And saith unto them, What seek ye? Notice the word seek or right to left, rabbinically keys. Now, Peter was, to my understanding, was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, right? And whatsoever he bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever he loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. In Matthew chapter 16, mm-hmm. verses uh, 16 through 20. But uh, John 138, what seek ye? Or what key are ye seeking? They, Andrew and John, who were once, uh, before verse 38, the disciples of John the Baptist, the, the cousins of the Lord Jesus Christ. What seek ye, or what key are you seeking for? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master. Stop right there. They were seeking for the Master key. Help me, Holy Spirit. They were accustomed to touching all of these keys on this uh, ecclesiastical key chain of history. They knew the Torah. They knew the prophets, major and minor. They knew the history of the kings, queens, and potentates, and the monarchs, and the patriarchs uh, of the Old Testament era. 
they understood the 430 years of servitude that Israel spent in Egyptian bondage. They understood the 70 years of servitude where uh, they spent, uh, where they were enslaved in uh, the Assyrian captivity for 70 years. They understood this. And those years that they spent in, in Babylonian captivity during the time of the prophet Daniel. But they could not properly understand my apostle the understanding of all of these keys on the king chain, on the key chain because there was no connect with the master key which would unlock all of these other previous keys in history. And, and let me say this, I'm, I, I promise you I'm going to get out of the way, Lord Jesus. In other words here, when he was saying, Rabbi, leadership, which is to say master, they were seeking for the master key. Now, here's the question from his new disciples and disciplines. They're asking the master, my friend, where dwellest thou? I want the listeners to hear us tonight. Apostle knows this. My friend, they were not asking the master for his physical location. <laughs> they were asking the master, where are you dwelling supernaturally? I, I want you, now people say, oh, the Bible doesn't say that. Listen, here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, we are not those who teach Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible so says so, or go, uh, David Sue Goliath, but we never got around about why David Sue Goliath and why he picked up the five smooth stones. That, we're not that, and again, I'm not casting stones or excursions at, at, on any other Christian uh, radio station. But what I'm saying that they were not asking the master for his physical address they were asking him, they were, not, they were not asking him, where are you living, but where are you dwelling? That's inhabitation. That's habitation. That's leadership. Where are you dwelling? So he says unto them, come and see, and this is where we get the term common sense. It is a sense that it, they can echo to my shy. It is a sense that only those who have a connect with the mass, master key can understand. Common sense. It is a sense that is not common in the church. And they, Andrew and John, came and saw, notice the word saw or spell it rabbinically from right to left, they came and saw or was where he dwelt. Help me, Holy Spirit. Not only Jesus became them, but them became Jesus. That's, again, before we get into teamship, there's got to be intimacy and saw or, or was where he dwelt and abode. In other words, though their physical bodies were still in time talking to Jesus, but the spirit of who they are transcended time in this text. And the both with him that day, a day to the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. For it was about the tenth hour or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then one of the two which heard John speak, and, and here is apostolic leadership. And the apostolic doctrine being fully established, my friend. I'm reading from the King James Version, John 1 40. One of the two, notice John chapter 1, verse 40. 1 plus 40 is 41. Remember, he sent the 12 out in, six, in sets of 6. And he sent the 70 out in sets of 35. 6 and 35, 41. Now in John 1, in 40, 41, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him, John who? John the Baptist, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Stop right there. So, again, you know me, man of God. I love breaking down letters. So, Andrew A, Simon S, Peter P. That is the acronym ASP, 
ASP, which means apostolic. Now, people are saying, I don't see it, Bishop. Listen, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to stretch you. So when Christ commands us to be stretched, he removes here the disease of doubt. Andrew A. Simon S. Peter P., that is the acronym for the word apostolic. And did not um, Paul say to his son Timothy concerning act to teach? Now, somebody said, well, you know, 1 Corinthians 4, 20, 4, 28, first apostles A, secondarily prophets P, thirdly teachers, act to teach. Man, God, what I'm saying, this cannot be by accident. The master then begins, though he ordains both Andrew and John to follow him, but only the brother of Andrew, Simon, who was called Peter by Jesus, had to be incorporated in this inner circle of Andrew, John, and Simon in order to activate the apostolic. And it seems like Christ is developing and, and thus creating the apostolic model for leadership. Uh, what say you, my apostle, in that endeavor? No, I, I, I agree. I think it, it's, <clears throat> it's a very leadership to God. Is, it, I, that's why I said spirit, spirit-led. And what you're describing oh, really is, the, is the process of spiritual development. And so I think that mm-hmm. it's one of those things, Bishop, where if we don't see it as a spiritual thing, it's well, everything you just said, it's really, and everything I've said the last hour and uh, 45 minutes, it means nothing if it's not a spiritual perspective. And so, that's it. and again, that's, that, that's why Christ ordained them first, because he, was, he had to teach them something they never heard before. He had to equip them and train them to understand that he was going to be saying some spiritual things to them that they were not ready for. And he had to, they had oh to walk goodness. with him to get a revelation on it. And so I think that, that it's important what you're saying, but the, the listeners and, and those who, 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 who are new to this, they have to have a spiritual mind to really grasp the level of wisdom and understanding that the Holy Spirit is trying to share because you have to have that worldview to really appreciate it. Hey, Amen, God. You know what? I, I'm going to ask you a question. I, I want to give my two-minute synopsis and in, in, in what is happening with the church today. Why? What? What is plaguing us? What? What is plaguing the church today? Number one, and number two, how can we? What are the solutions to rid ourselves of this plague? And and what the, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me to, uh, spoke to me today quickly in prayer is that there is a one of the plagues that the Lord showed me in prayer was the plague of what we call replacement theology. And allow, allow me to, to explain that. <laughs> replacement theology. We have replaced, my apostle, we have replaced impartation for impartation. I, I want the listeners to write this down, and the apostle knows this. We have replaced apostolic impartation with the religion of impartition. That we have created schisms and divisions in the church because you got apostles. You, we, we don't have a true apostle. We don't have true apostles like uh, Apostle J.L. Matthew. You got these so-called apostles out there today, man of God, that unless you agree with the revelation that they're saying, that you're not an apostle. That's not impartation. That's impartation. That is uh, a, a spiritual, spiritual cancer, a schism that is killing us. But the psychic uh, replacement of theology, replacement theology that is happening today, we have replaced uh Impartation with imputation, <laughs> capital I N P U T A T I O N. In other words, we're not apostolically imparting into the next generation to be greater than us. 
Because like we said, we want to be the great one. Not you and I, Apostle, but I'm saying you have mindsets that, that and unless it runs through them, there is no them. So imputation is the spirit of, of not just accusation, but the minds of, mindset of what we call insinuation. And I'm, I'm, I need your help, man. God, God showed me something today. He said, he said, Bishop, there is a cancer along, not just to replace in theology, okay, but also there is a cancer. And he said these words of cognitive dissonance. I said, what did you say, Holy Spirit? He said cognitive dissonance. I had to look it up. I've never heard of this term before. The Holy Spirit will speak to you, to, uh, not to apostles, but he already knows this, but to, to many of our listeners, the Holy Spirit will give you words that you have never heard before. I had to look it up. Cognitive dissonance is a mental discomfort or a mental stress or stressor that is experienced by a person or persons who hold two or more contradictory beliefs, ideals, or values. This discomfort is triggered by a situation in which a belief, get this, my apostle, a belief system of a person is threatened. When a belief system of a person clashes with new evidence as brought through Apostle J.L. Macklin in Global Spiritual Revolution Radio, that is perceived by that person. In other words, when that person is confronted in love with facts and repertory insight that contradicts their personal belief system or ideals or values, people will find a way to resolve the contradiction in order to reduce their discomfort. It, it's, man, God, it seems like, that, you know, there's such, we are such a threat. What is that, my friend? Help me with this. As well, we're well, posting well, about the leadership on it. Oh. Well, let's, let's for, for two minutes, let's go into the deep side of the pool. Everything you just described happens because they have not been swept. You oh, see, he's my apostle. Wow. Jesus, Jesus was, Jesus was, this is what's amazing. Jesus was talking about, and I've said it a thousand times, evil spirit goes out of a man, he goes to the dry places, so he can rest, find his none. Then he comes back to his house from which I came and says, I will, he wants to go back in his house. He said he brings seven other spirits and a person more wicked than they were. What's happened is you can't take on a leadership role mid-deliverance. Oh, God. In other words, if God is casting, if God is having you in the process of deliverance as a leader, no one, and, and it's a chance that no one may know about it. Nobody may know. But if you have yes. multiple personalities within you, because Jesus everybody Paul, does until right. they met Jesus. Everybody <laughs> does. But oh until you have wow. Jesus sweep you, and take out the strong man, you will constantly have cognitive dissonance. There's a multiplicity of voices mm. and words and identities within each person that until Jesus Christ has become the strong man in their lives, they will never, ever, ever break free. You will constantly have your struggles in your personal life. You will constantly do things and you'll constantly have a battle. You don't know if you're a man or a woman, if you're going to lead, if you're, you don't know all those things because there's, right. there's cognitive dissonance. You're confused. And so when Jesus mm. said when the blind leaves the blind, unless they both fall in the ditch, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a spiritual metaphor. That if, right. if, in other words, if you haven't seen the light, you can't introduce me to light because you haven't seen mm. it yourself. And, and so he is the light. And so I think it's important that, that we realize that, that, that you know, I, I love the term cognitive dissonance. It's one of my favorite terms to use. I'm happy you brought it up. Now yes. I don't have to use it because you used it a lot. So cognitive, <laughs> and, and most people, I'm serious, yes. 
most people don't know what that word means, but that's what our media does to us it. every day. No, that's right. what the media does. That's what every – all this stuff is designed to make you have split personalities, to make mm-hmm. you take on the understanding and the entities of another person. That's why impartation is a normal thing in this earthly realm. Because when I watch news, oh, okay. I digest what that person is saying to me. When I'm in a church listening to this person, I'm digesting. If I, the moment I apply what he's saying, I'm taking on that identity. It goes on and on and on. So cognitive dissonance is something that people are specializing in on this realm and that it's affecting the church leadership because we want to be in the world, but we also want to be a Christian. You can't have both. Either you're on Christ's no. team or you're not on his team. And so people are dealing with it, my friend, and they don't know how to deal with cognizant, cognitive dissonance because no one's ever taught them that you've got to get rid of your former master by accepting a new mm. one. And it's the new one whose laws, whose ways, whose information that you must obey. And until you've done that, you are not fit to lead others into doing that process if you yourself have not done it. I am so happy. I am so happy that you brought this up. I don't understand why many women want to jump into deliverance ministry and they got so many disorders in them. I, you know, you made mention of that term empty swept and garnish there in uh, Matthew 12 and 45. Empty swept and garnish. But my apostle, I just saw something here that similar to that verse, in Matthew twelve forty five, is a verse of scripture in Luke uh, chapter eleven, verse number twenty five. Christ doesn't make mention of the word empty in Luke eleven twenty five, because in Matthew twelve forty five, empty is what Christ. But Luke eleven eleven twenty five. And when he cometh, he findeth it not empty, swept, and garnished, but swept and garnished, which means this vessel is not empty, but it's still swept and garnished. And people said, well, um, uh, Luke was just given another synoptical view. What meant? No, 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 no. See, again, it get, that gets back to teaching man of God. You got the person there in Matthew 12, 45, who is empty, swept, and garnished. There is no Holy Spirit, right? But the, now, because of that vacancy of this room, seven other spirits come in, other, which means the chief and demon, um, they come in, packs, takes with them of it seven other spirits. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. But Jesus doesn't use the word empty in Luke 11, 25. Because this individual, though they are swept and garnished, but they're still not empty because there is a demon or a disorder in their thinking. Um, my apostle, anything that you want to add, I'm telling you that this is going to be an ongoing series here, and I am so excited. Any lasting words, man of God, before we close out tonight in Jesus' name? Uh, uh, Bishop, I, I just want the, the, the listeners to really – you know what I want I to say? I want your listeners to ask themselves a question. Are they being taught to lead or are they being taught to follow? Mm. Because everyone is a leader in the kingdom of God, but it's a capacity decision. God determines the yeah. capacity. So think of yourself as a leader. You, you may not lead a church, but you are a leader of your gift. You're a leader of your home. So yes. seek leadership, and, and I pray the Lord reveals it to you. The Lord spoke to me uh, not too long ago. He, he says, this is wisdom for leadership, and I'll leave this. He says, we change the thinking of our behavior when the pain 
to stay the same becomes greater than the pain to change. And, oh, my apostle, you got to hold me back. This is wisdom for leadership today. In order to change our behavior in the thinking that changes that behavior, when the pain to stay the same becomes greater than the pain to change. And to all of you young preachers out there, I know there is a pain to remain the same, but you have to accept the greater pain in order to change the same. You've got to accept there is pain when it comes to change, but that pain is much greater than the pain to, to remain the same. Thank you so much, Apostle, and uh, we, I love you so much, um, my friend. Thank you so much for pouring into us tonight in, in Jesus' Always. mighty name. Always. God oh, bless you, man. Thank I, you. God, God oh my God! This is ongoing, uh, an ongoing apostolic series. Thank you so much, my friend. Leadership, spiritual leadership, and development in the 21st century church with my friend and um, the, I'm telling you, uh, the most powerful apostle that we've had here uh, in 25 years here at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Amen. And please so into. Uh, Global Spiritual Revolution uh, Radio, if you feel the leading of the Lord to do so. Amen. Uh, no, we're not seeking finances. We're seeking to change people's lives. But I also at the same time, it takes finances to sustain a global ministry. Please go online to paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. Again, paypal.me forward slash GSRR Media Group. When you give unto the Lord, he will give you more to give. Good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. But whatever you mean, the Lord will measure to it to you again. Thank you so much, Apostle. I love you in Jesus' name. Apostle, we'll be back with us next week for part two of leadership, spiritual leadership and development in the 21st century apostolic church. We're going to be uploading this tonight on social media, including YouTube.com forward slash Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you next Tuesday. We're going to have Dr. Carl Gallus back with us next Tuesday as we talk about part two of his books, The Gods of Ground Zero. And next Wednesday, amen, Apostle and I will be discussing. He will. We will be sitting at his feet as we will be going into part two of leadership, spiritual leadership and development in the 21st century church. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend. Amen, for we are raising the consciousness of mankind to become the consciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good night in the name of the Lord.